Good morning, church. <clears throat> so we're close to concluding our study on the Holy Spirit. Probably one more week uh, is what it looks like to me, probably June 7. Um, and as you know, the focus of this study has uh, not been related to miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're going to discuss that today, uh, and we're going to plow through uh, probably everything I know about the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, but that hasn't been my intent from the beginning. My intent from the beginning, as I started studying this almost a year ago now, uh, has been to better understand the indwelling of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit in my life as it is connected to the Word of God. And uh, I must probably confess to you that uh, there was a good number of years uh, in my Christian walk where I uh, was academically aware uh, that I had the indwelling of the Spirit, uh, the promise of the Spirit uh, indwelling me, and in fact it was indwelling me. But beyond that, uh, I'm not really sure I understood the nature of the indwelling of the Spirit. And so my intent has been to try to promote persuade and convince you uh, of not only the indwelling but of the power of that indwelling as it relates to your Christian walk, uh, being led by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, walk in the light. And we'll, uh, we'll kind of wrap up that discussion next week, but I don't know how you could teach a course on the Holy Spirit and not at least spend a little bit of time on the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, and so we'll do that today. Now, there's two, two kinds of gifts. There's miraculous gifts, temporary miraculous gifts, and then there are uh, permanent gifts of the Holy Spirit, and hopefully we'll look at both of those today. My first uh, introduction to uh, uh, the concept of miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, goes all the way back to my childhood on a black and white television set in Vernon, Texas. I was probably 8, 9, 10 years old. I'm sure I had not reached 13 yet. And while I was a believer, I was not a baptized believer at that time, but I'd been in church all my life. And on that black and white television set uh, on that particular Sunday afternoon, my parents were watching uh, an Oral Roberts uh, uh, crusade program. Of course, they had an elevated stage, uh, and uh, Oral Roberts uh, had his pleading about the nature of the miracles of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, across the front of that platform, there was an iron railing, uh, some kind of iron railing. And of course, they finally had the altar call where he begged people to come forward and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, tongue speaking, so on and so forth. And uh, I recall on that particular Sunday, there were a lot of people who, who responded, but they invited a few of those people up on the platform with Oral Roberts. And uh, in, in that uh, ecstatic moment, that you see in, in the Pentecostal movement, and I don't know if you've ever attended uh, any of their services, I have, and it's quite incredible uh, what goes on uh, uh, in those services. But there was a lady who was crying uh, profusely, and, uh, and she was signaled out by Will Roberts. He brought her to the front of the rail. She was leaning over the rail, and, and he was gonna exercise this demon spirit that was it in her, and he was patting her on the back, slapping her on the back, not, not too forcefully, but when he would hit her, you could t tell she, she's moving. And uh, she's leaning over the rail, and, and tears are rolling everywhere. And of course, when I cry, then I usually have a little bit of mucus build up in my nose that usually uh, requires me to blow my nose. But in this case, uh, he uh, persuaded the audience that that mucus release was really the exercising of the demon, and he was screaming, uh, as all the people in the audience were screaming, come out of you demon, come out of you demon. And when uh, finally uh, uh, this, this mucus fell to the ground, uh, they deemed the success of the exercise of the Spirit through the power of the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, being a conservative raised uh, theologian back then, uh, I was horrified. Of, uh, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because uh, I just didn't understand them at first I'd ever seen of them, my first exposure. And uh, since then, uh, you know, we've learned a lot and studied a lot to know better about some of these things. Our response in the church has historically been a very aggressive 
response around the gifts of the Holy Spirit because of Pentecostalism and the holiness movement and our battle with Pentecostalism and the holiness movement. And I think that we need to be prepared to answer questions from any honest heart that comes and asks questions about uh, our understanding of the gifts, the miraculous gifts, temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. I think it's our responsibility to be prepared to always give an answer uh, around the things that we believe. Uh, however, uh, now that I'm quite a bit older, uh, those battles have been fought. I'm not sure whether they were won. Some probably won, some probably lost. Uh, but that's not uh, a battle about the temporary gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's just not my battle. Uh, and I guess it's simply not my battle. My wife asked me this week how I was feeling about my lesson preparation of my lesson. I started on Monday. I, I, I'd already studied this material, but uh, trying to once again refresh my memory. And she said, how are you feeling about it? And I said, well, I just don't, I'm not feeling the enthusiasm that I normally feel about talking about some of the things I, I teach about. And uh, so I've explored why my enthusiasm was a bit lower. And uh, it, it's just because I think because I've never seen a miracle. I, you know, if you show me one, uh, I might uh, have to rethink my position on it. But the only miracles I'm aware of are those that are recorded in Scripture that were performed by Jesus, by the apostles, uh, a few instances in the Old Testament. But since the first century when the church was established uh, uh, and, and as it spread uh, in, in the first century, are the only recordation of miracles that I'm aware of. And, uh, and, and, and I just haven't seen one. So, you know, if I ever see a valid one, I might rethink my position on that. It might be of more interest to me. Uh, but my interest in, in knowing about the temporary miraculous gifts of the Spirit today is just to be able to be prepared to give an answer when someone asks me a, a logical and reasonable question. Uh, and so, uh, let's take a quick look at, at the temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Next slide, please. I want to be sure first and foremost that we never ever confuse the indwelling of the Spirit as a gift versus the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is the empowering. And this has caused us so much consternation within the body of Christ where we commingle that discussion. And all of a sudden, every time we read of the Holy Spirit, we think it's miraculous and we don't want to touch it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to understand it. But if we get to, and when we get to the, the, the non-miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, we're going to have to talk about gifts of the Holy Spirit out of Romans chapter 12. It's of necessity that we must talk about them, for Paul talks about them in Romans chapter 12. Now, in, in setting the context um, for this discussion, uh, and before we elaborate just a little bit more on this slide, uh, I want you to, to, to think about the structure of the New Testament. And what we see, uh, in the, it, it, we only see really uh, the temporary uh, miraculous gifts of the Spirit discussed in the book of Acts and really in 1 Corinthians. Now, they're mentioned in other epistles. I get that. They're mentioned in other places in the New Testament. I totally get that. I'm not ignoring that. But I'm talking about as far as emphasis and there being a collection or a body of writing about Holy Spirit uh, and the gifts, the temporary gifts of the Holy Spirit, it basically falls in the book of Acts and in the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, the book of Acts is the history book of how the church was established, when the church was established, and the spread of the church. And that's where, if you want to understand the journeys or the travels of Paul, you're going to really get that out of the book of Acts. And as he, as he and Peter and John, which are the, the uh, well, yeah, yeah, they're the three principal disciples, that you, or the apostles that you read about in the book of Acts. There's others that you read about. But I'm talking about principal. They appear over and over and over again. And they're working to establish the church uh, all over that area of the world at the time. And so if you're going to know about the travels of Paul, the expansion of the church, where the, where the congregations are located, whether or not they had, uh, in some instances, whether or not they had elders, some of the structure of the church, you're going to read that out of the book of Acts. 
And, and what you're going to read is also the temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit out of the book of Acts. And, and those gifts are being performed, or those miracles are being performed, the laying on of hands are taking place in order to authenticate to these various believers in a multitude of cities, Thessalonica, Corinth, Lacia, a multitude of cities, to authenticate to them that there is good, just cause for them to have changed their lives, given up what they used to be, to become what they now are, believers and Christians in a Roman Empire that is not Christian friendly. Now, once you get out of that history book of the book of Acts, the next major treatise on spirit, no, on the uh, temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit is 1 Corinthians. And it was not necessarily written to endorse miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. It does endorse them, but it wasn't written for that exact purpose. The book of 1 Corinthians in the second letter, 2 Corinthians, was written to a church that has many troubles as any church could have. They didn't understand while they were in Christ and they were redeemed and they had the indwelling of the Spirit and they had some of the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. They didn't understand the spirit of the Christian walk, not by any means. And so Paul spent an inordinate amount of time explaining to the church at Corinth a lot of things about the Christian walk. They didn't understand, they didn't get, they didn't, they didn't have a real concept of the spirit of Christianity as it related to the Lord's Supper. And they didn't certainly have any concept of the spirit of the walk as it related to the use of the temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul spends an enormous amount of time trying to straighten out that church as it relates to the, non -temp uh, to the temporary non uh, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to understand that every church had, and every believer in every church had the indwelling of the Spirit across the board. And the rest of the New Testament, the bulk of the New Testament, the bulk of the New Testament, even in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, is written to underscore the importance and the power of the indwelling of the Spirit versus the gifts of the Spirit. The indwelling of the Spirit coupled with the Word and the difference that that makes in a believer's life versus these temporary miraculous gifts of the Spirit. And so this, this slide has importance to us because John 7, 38, 39, where Jesus has not been glorified, he promises again the indwelling of the Spirit. In John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, to the, to the apostles themselves, he says that the Spirit that's been with you will now be in you. In Galatians, we're told that the Spirit will be in us. In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit will be in us. Galatians 4, 6, the Spirit will be in us. And even in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Spirit will be in us. But also we will have in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for the first century only, the temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit in the church. And so there's a world of difference between the indwelling of the Spirit, which is really the focus of the New Testament walk, versus the conversation around the uh, temporary miraculous gifts of the Spirit. As a matter of fact, uh, I think this is right. Uh, you, you'll need to check it for yourself. I believe that tongue speaking, tongue speaking, the ability to speak in tongues is only mentioned four times in the New Testament. Uh, maybe five times. I'll have to check. But four or five times, not many. And of the times that it's mentioned in the, in, the, in the book of Acts, interesting enough, not one time, now listen, not one time in the book of Acts, not one time in the book of Acts does it state the purpose of being able to speak in tongues. Now we infer out of our study of 1 Corinthians and Paul's uh, work of correction around the gifts, we infer and we're able to, to, to come back to why the gifts were important in the book of Acts. But if you do a serious reading of the book of Acts, there's not one time that tongue speaking, the reason for tongue speaking is defined in the book of Acts. Now, we later know that it was for the purpose of authentication and that it was unto God. We get that. And we'll study that in just a moment. But, but there, the, the, the emphasis is just not on the miraculous gifts of the Spirit. It is on the indwelling of the Spirit. Now, with that being said, next slide, please. 
There's always been periods of special testimony or, 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 or periods of miracles throughout all the Bible. Uh, Moses needed uh, miracles in order to establish himself as a leader. It was the witness of his office as a prophet and leader of the people. And it was, it was for the purpose of causing the people, Israel, to accept him as God's messenger and his message as from being from God. Not much difference than the exact purpose of miracles with the apostles to confirm the word, to prove the authenticity of the messenger and the message. Then in Elijah and in, in, in Elisha, we see that there is a special, special period of time of miracles as well. And at that time, if you recall, uh, all the priests had essentially abandoned Israel. They'd gone off and, and, and followed after Baal. And so there was a period of time of some very special miracles in these two men's lives, Elijah and Elisha, in order to call that nation back to repentance, to authenticate the message of God, that you'll be cursed if you disobey, you'll be blessed if you obey, a reestablishment of those promises. And so there was a period of time there where miracles were needed in order to get Israel's attention. And then certainly as it relates to Christ and the apostles, uh, there was a need to authenticate the credentials of the Messiah and that his message was from God. And as you recall, the Pharisees challenged whether or not his message was from God, saying, well, look, the miracles that he does, he doesn't do from God, he does from Beelzebub. Next slide, please. So, with that in mind, and because the purpose of all of my lessons hasn't really been to want to try to explain miraculous gifts, the temporary miraculous gifts of the Spirit, I've grouped to the best of my ability, I think, the, the temporary miraculous gifts of the Spirit into seven categories. And the first category is a little bit of an anomaly. I get that because it says apostleship, and you're wondering, well, I don't know about that. Well, my point is, and we're going to see in just a moment, that the apostleship is critical to this discussion because they are the transmission uh, mechanism. Uh, they're the mechanics behind uh, the temporary miracul uh, miraculous gifts of the Spirit being transferred to other individuals through the laying on of hands. And outside of the apostles laying on the hands in the first century, uh, after the church is established, there is no transmission of spiritual gifts that I could find, uh, miraculous spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit that I could find uh, within the Bible. And so the apostles are, are, are part and parcel to this discussion in a big time way. Uh, it is true, as far as I can tell, that every apostle had uh, the, the temporary miraculous powers, uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, and that they were able to transfer those gifts to other individuals through the laying on of hands. Now, what about this apostleship is unique and important to this discussion? Well, first, an apostle is a delegate, as defined by, by Thayer, or a messenger as one who is sent with orders. In other words, they're sent on a mission. And so these apostles uh, bear that name, but they have a purpose behind that name of doing some serious work for God. Um, we know from Matthew 10, uh, 1 and 2, that every apostle was chosen by the Lord himself. There were 14 apostles. Uh, we started with the original 12. Uh, Judas uh, went off the tracks, eventually committed suicide. He was replaced uh, in, in Acts chapter 1 uh, with another apostle, and that apostle was chosen by the Lord. And then we see that Paul, uh, as the 14th apostle, was also selected by the Lord. No one else chose apostles for the Lord except for the Lord himself. And so every one of these apostles who have the, the, the ability to perform miracles and the ability to pass on miracles were chosen by the Lord. Matthew 10, 1, Mark 3, 13, 14, also in the book of Luke. No doubt that every individual is specifically chosen by the Lord. Paul even uh, affirms that he was chosen by the Lord in Galatians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not by man nor a man, but by Jesus Christ, God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So he himself says that he was chosen by the Lord. Now... The second thing about these apostles uh, is that they, uh, uh, they were supplied with miraculous powers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2, uh, it, Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years was caught up to the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows, I don't know, but God knows. And then in Acts 1.1, 1, 1, 
uh, Jesus again affirms to the apostles, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witness in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then in Acts 5 and 12, well, Acts 2.43, you're familiar with Acts 5.12, it says, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. Acts 16.16 16 would be another example of, of once again evidencing that the apostles were able to perform uh, miraculous power. So first, they were chosen by God, uh, the Lord himself, and second, they had the ability to perform miraculous powers. The third aspect of an apostle was that they were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. We've already stated that, but in Acts 1.22, uh, it says, beginning with John's baptism, the time when Jesus was taken from it, for, I, for a, one of these must become a witness of the resurrection. That's the replacement of Judas as an apostle. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, in verse 11, uh, or 9 1, he says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Paul once again says, Look, you're telling me that I haven't seen Jesus. I've seen Jesus. I'm an eyewitness of his resurrection. And then the, the final aspect of an apostle as it relates uh, to, to the, all of this miraculous ability to transfer miracles is that the, uh, they laid the foundation for Jesus Christ and no one else. 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no one can lay any foundation than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. And so these apostles are part and parcel to this discussion about miracles because they were actually uh, the first individuals in the church who, who had miracles that they established with power to be witnesses, and they were the individuals who could pass on miracles. Um, the very fact that these apostles were chosen and were eyewitnesses of Jesus uh, eliminates the possibility. I want you to think logically with me. If the apostles were the originators in the church of the temporary miraculous gifts of the Spirit, and if they are the transmission mechanism, the mechanics, by the laying on of hands to be able to pass those temporary miraculous gifts to others, once the apostles ceased, since there is no succession plan for apostles, and there is no succession plan for apostles, because no one can meet the criteria required to be an apostle. They were not chosen by the Lord. They haven't seen his resurrection. Not able to perform miracles. There is no succession plan for apostles. If they are the mechanics of passion on the temporary miraculous gift of the Spirit, and once they cease to exist, thus the ability of the temporary miraculous gifts of the Spirit would cease. So it seems to me, logically. Now, the second element of gift that's on the list here is that of prophecy. And prophecy is the preferred gift, temporary gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to have any gift, you want prophecy. Tongue speaking is way down the list. But if you want any gift, prophecy is the one that you want. Uh, it's, it's set forth as the greatest gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. It, it, they, Paul says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies this, this gift of prophecy that you need to desire speaks to people for their strengthening, for encouraging them, and for comforting them. Anyone who speaks in a tongue only edifies themselves, but someone who prophesies benefits the entire church. And so prophecy is the desired gift, the temporary desired gift from the Holy Spirit for sure. Um, the third gift that's on the list here is, is miracles. It's rather a broad category. I've kind of grouped up uh, signs, wonders, and mighty works as a proof of an apostle. Uh, under, under this concept of miracles. Otherwise, uh, we'd have a list of 15 or 20 up here. But there's this, this big bucket of miracles, signs and wonders, mighty works. And uh, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 2, Paul affirms that his apostleship is based on the ability to perform signs, wonders, and, and, and mighty works. Uh, our fourth gift is, is that of healing, which... Uh, 
to be fair, is, is, is really, I believe, just a subcategory or part of, of the miracles, but it seems to be carved out uh, for a real specific reason. Um, and I think it generally has to do with the healing of the body or the mind, or maybe both. Now, I think it's very specific in its nature when they talk about healing, the, miracle, the uh, ability to perform the miracle of healing in the New Testament. Miracles, can, uh, miracles generally can apply to healing, but it can also apply to matters of judgment. Uh, if you were to take a look at Acts chapter 13 and read that context, uh, you'll see that there's a judgment being rendered on the individual and he struck blind uh, and, and placed in darkness uh, by a miracle uh, for, for, for judgment reasons. And so miracles can be used in a lot of different ways, but it seems like healing is specifically called out as one of the temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit as it relates to healing of the body, the mind of the individual. Then there's this fifth uh, bucket of tongues that we've mentioned, and it is only four times that they are mentioned uh, in Scripture. Uh, three times in the book of Acts, Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, three full chapters that talk about miraculous gifts, the temporary gifts of the, uh, well, temporary and, and permanent gifts, of the, but mostly temporary uh, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are, are talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. And, and, and in that discussion, this is where we find out what we know about gifts. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says in verse 2, he who speaks in a tongue speaks in the direction of or unto God and not unto man. No reference of that in the book of Acts. In verses 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we find out that tongues are inferior to prophecy as a means of edification. We just talked about that. Tongues are inferior to other gifts. In verses 14 through 17, Paul lists three actions that are engaged by those who speak in tongues. Those actions are praying, singing, and giving of thanks. For those who speak in tongues, it's praying, singing, and giving of thanks according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, and, and all three of these are direct, all three of those activities are directed toward God, not toward men. And then in verse 26 through 28, tongues uh, should not be used in an assembly at all unless an interpreter is present to interpret. They're, they're just, you know, prophecy is available in all times in the first century as a temporary miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit, but tongues are not exercised all the time in the assembly unless someone is there to interpret. And then in verses uh, 21 uh, and following, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, interesting enough, you would think that if tongue speaking does take place in the assembly, and there is an interpreter, that's the only time it would be allowed in the first century church, that then all of the believers would be encouraged as a result of that. Well, not according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 21. It says that the purpose of tongue speaking is persuade unbelievers, not believers. It's, it's for unbelievers, not believers. It's to evidence the authenticity of the gospel. Uh, there's a few lines of uh, uh, arguments around this. Uh, uh, you know, speaking in tongues began on Pentecost. It's not a part of the Old Testament, uh, and it's certainly not a part of the life of Christ. All the miracles that he performed, all the things that, all the actions that he took, and all the various regions that he walked, not a single time does it sp speak of him as having sp spoken in tongues in order to, th to authenticate uh, his message. Uh, Speaking in tongues is no test of salvation. There's not a single instance, not a single instance in Scripture where salvation and tongue speaking is connected in any form or fashion. Uh, it's just simply one of the gifts, the temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. But it has nothing to do with redemption. That's, you know, I am concerned about people who claim they have gifts, and I want to talk to them about that because I think a, an honest study of the Scripture will convince them maybe otherwise. But as it relates to salvation, it has no bearing on salvation. You know, my ability to speak in tongue, not speak in tongue, is not going to get me to heaven any faster or any slower. I am redeemed, and I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So, uh, this modern day phenomenon of tongue speaking that exists in the world today is nowhere near similar 
to the experiences that took place in the New Testament church during the first century. Um, uh, Pentecostalism teaches that the ability to speak in tongues is, stepping, is, set, is stepping to the next higher level of spirituality. That would be contrary to everything that we've studied and said about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That our step to in spirituality, if there is a next step, comes through the empowering of the Holy Spirit in conjunction, connected, conjoined to the Word of God dwelling in us. That's where spirituality, you know, I, I said from the very beginning, you can't be spiritual and not know the Spirit. And so nothing has changed from that statement to this day today. And so there is nothing special about being able to speak in tongues. Uh, I don't think there's any validity around the claim of the next level. The interpreting of gifts, uh, number six here, is simply the, the divinely wrought ability to translate that which has been spoken in a static uh, utterance to God. Uh, uh, to uh, individuals who could not understand that, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 10. And then finally, there is a, 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 a gift of discerning spirits. You know, wherever um, there is anything that is authentic, there's always something counterfeit. That's just always true. Wherever there is truth, there will always be the opposite side of error. And so one of the things in the first century church that was uh, incredibly important was the ability to discern from the evil to the good spirits. And so the discerning the spirits was a temporary power of the gift of the Holy Spirit in the first century church, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 10. Uh, we are now dependent not upon the temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit to discern the truth or the authenticity or the genuineness of, of, of God's word versus the, the, the word of, of some devil. Uh, we're now charged to do that. Every Christian is charged to do that, not by the miraculous uh, temporary gift of the Holy Spirit, but by the word. We now have the word, and the word is able to help identify and establish that which is true and that which is false. So I believe those seven categories capture the overall context of what I think uh, represents the temporary miraculous gifts of the Spirit. Next slide, please. So, we've already established that the uh, in Acts chapter 8, in verses 5 through 25, uh, you'll see that there's the story of Philip, uh, and he's full of the Holy Spirit according to Acts chapter 6. He, it appears to me that Philip's, this is the same Philip that was chosen as a deacon in Acts chapter 6. And it has the story of John uh, and Peter and the Samaritans and Simon the sorcerer. Uh, and it's clear to me that the uh, uh, Samaritans had received from the Spirit gifts through the dis disposition of the apostles' hands, uh, as, as, as the Spirit declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 11, where Paul says the Spirit gives gifts as he wills. Well, in Acts chapter 8, by the laying on of hands, the apostles were able to pass on some of these miraculous gifts. Uh, so miraculous gifts are transferred from the apostles to those individuals in order to confirm the word. And it's the spirit, the empowering of the spirit, not the indwelling, the empowering of the spirit that takes place in order to confirm the word according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11, for the spirit gives those gifts as he wills. Uh, miraculous gifts were temporary as compared to the non-miraculous non, uh, gifts. Uh, Ken did a really good job of this. Uh, my goodness, it's been a good number of weeks ago, but in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and about verse 8 and following, it, it, it says that those that prophesy, prophesy in part, and those that speak in tongues, everything's a part, a part of something, right? And as you get down to verse 10, it says all these things that are just a part of something, they're going to pass away. They're going to go away, and then we'll have the completeness of that which is real. And so, so, so everything here is related to temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit is, is, is truly temporary in nature. They're going to move away. And finally, the purpose of the gifts uh, uh, the very uh, biblical purpose of the gifts uh, was to demonstrate the temporary and provisional character of the gifts. Uh, the miracles according to Christ were to incite and to cause some to believe that he indeed was the spokesman of God in John chapter 10, verse 32, 38. 
For Jesus says to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? You're not stoning me for my good works. We are not stoning you for your good works, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? Jesus is performing these miracles to incite these Pharisees, these heretics, to believe that in fact he is the son of God. And of course they reject him and accuse him of blasphemy. Next slide, please. So, the purpose, the threefold purpose of the gifts. Number one, they, deserve, they serve as the credentials uh, for the apostles, proving that they were from God. They spoke on his authority and in his stead. Um, Acts 2.43 says everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Acts 5.12, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's court. 2 Corinthians 5.18-21, uh, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he was committed, and he committed to us the spirit of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So it is that uh, that that purpose of, of of credentialing of exactly who these apostles are. Otherwise, all the apostles would have considered to be nothing more than ignorant Galileans if they had not had this credentialing. The second. Uh, temporary, uh, the second purpose of the temporary miraculous gifts was in order to allow men, finite men, to become the tools through which the word was delivered. Now that's different than confirming the word. That's the third purpose of the temporary miraculous gifts. But the second purpose of the temporary miraculous gifts uh, was in order to allow finite men to receive the word. The Spirit delivered the word to them. In 2 Peter 1.21, for prophets never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, the human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 13, we read multiple times where, where Paul affirms that all the mystery, all the gospel that he's preaching, all that he's writing, all that he has to say about anything has now been revealed to him through the Holy Spirit. That as a finite man, he did not have the capability of understanding nor pinning the words that needed to be pinned as it related to salvation and the gospel. But he says, the Spirit has given that to me. And so it was uh, the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit was to allow finite men who had no ability to do this, now all of a sudden to be the messengers of God. And finally, it was used to confirm the word. In Mark chapter 16, when Jesus gives the great commission to the, the, uh, uh, the apostles, he, uh, in verse 20 it says, Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and, and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. And so miracles were, uh, number one, to uh, prove the authenticity of the apostles, uh, uh, to allow them to, to, to give us the word, and finally to confirm the word. Now, uh, let's take a look, and, 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 I, and that's my discussion on the, on, the, on the temporary miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, you go study it for yourself, but until we see one, we're not going to believe much. Now, let's go to the next slide, please, very quickly. Let's look at the permanent, non-miraculous gifts of the Spirit. Now this is an interesting discussion to me. Uh, I very rarely hear this taught or preached uh, anywhere in the church, and I've been in the church 67 years. Since I was a little bitty baby, my mama's been carrying me to church. And I'd really like to uh, start with number three uh, on the list, uh, rather than, than, than teaching around administration, ruling, and pastoring. Uh, 
1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, 28. Now you are the body of Christ, and you are severally members thereof. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, and then he uses the word governments. Governments. And, and, that's, and there's a form of that word in, used later in the book of Acts and in Revelation. And in all three instances, it means leader or helmsman or steersman, guidance. I think the uh, uh, New International Version actually uses the word either counsel or guidance. But it speaks to the leadership of the church, administration of the church. Now, we formulated the process. It's a good process. No criticism of the process of where we uh, select men amongst ourselves that we think are spiritual men. And we go through an evaluation process, or really I believe it's more of an opportunity for those men that we think might uh, meet the qualifications of an elder, uh, to be reflective on their own lives. They have to uh, uh, reveal their lives to generally a special a group of men that have been selected to, to coordinate that activity. And, and uh, everything about their past is laid, laid forward. Uh, to ensure that these men have a spiritual tone about them. Not just meet the qualifications. They must meet the qualifications of Timothy and Titus. Don't misunderstand me. But we want more than just people who pass the bar. We want that spiritual tone. And the reason I emphasize that, it's clear to me in Romans chapter 12 and 7, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, that these men have a gift, a special gift of the Holy Spirit. A, a, a gift that resides with us today in order to be able to minister. Now, we, we hesitate on saying these men are filled with the Spirit. But in fact, they are filled with the Spirit. And we wouldn't want non-Spirit-filled uh, men to lead our congregation in any form or fashion. And the reason I wanted to choose this one first is it's very clear to me that when we think an elder doesn't fulfill their role, uh, we as members generally are quick to point that out to them. Now, with that being said, if we were to go back to the very first permanent non-miraculous gift of teaching, or the second one of ministering or helping, or evangelism, or exhortation, or giving, it's interesting that we are not very prone to quickly point out amongst the members those who are not using their gifts. And uh, Every one of these gifts are defined as spiritual gifts within the context of Scripture. They're not just something that Dave Short made up this morning. So I want you to go to Romans chapter 12 with me. And let's just read for a moment. This will probably exhaust our time, and we may have to finish the discussion next week. Because I really believe these permanent, non-miraculous gifts are the core of the discussion when it comes to the indwelling of the Spirit, of, of walking by the Spirit. So in Romans chapter 12, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and this is proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, brethren, that transformation is not going to take place without the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. You will not get it done by yourself. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his, his, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment and according with the faith God has distributed each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these uh, members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, uh, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, we have different gifts. We have different gifts. According to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then you should prophesy in accordance with your faith. It, if, if it is serving, a non-miraculous gift, if it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then you ought to teach. If it is to encourage, 
then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, if it is to be an elder, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And then if you were to read the rest of that context then in the chapter, you would see more of the Christian walk as it relates to living by the Spirit. But here clearly are some gifts that are given by the Spirit. They're delineated here. Other non-miraculous gifts that parallel many of these are found in 1 Corinthians in Paul's discussion in 12 through 14. So there is such a thing that exists, and, you know, we've perverted this to call it talents. Well, you know, someone has a talent to do this, and maybe that's okay. I don't really, pretty indifferent to that. But the fact that there are individuals who have something more than someone else to be able to accomplish some of these things, uh, I think is clear from Scripture. Now, we, and I have heard it said, well, you know, anybody can exhort, right? Anybody can exhort. Well, that's true. That's absolutely true. Anybody can perform any of these gifts, but it appears to me that some of these gifts are maybe uh, uh, some individuals are endowed with a special measure of the ability to do some of these things. Uh, and next week, we don't have time this week, we're going to look at eight criteria on this concept just of giving. Everybody can give, and we all give. But there are eight different references in Scripture as to how that giving takes place that makes it really special to God. And I'm not sure that I qualify in every one of those eight areas that we'll talk about next week. So, brethren, there is something around that we should seriously consider. Permanent spiritual gifts that exist in the church today. Non-miraculous in every way. And those gifts are established by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I think many times, grown over time, as the Spirit lives in us. Therefore, you can see the resistant danger in denying the indwelling of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit in your lives. You may never reach your potential as it relates to these spiritual gifts. Not once. So, next week we'll pick up, finish this discussion here, and hopefully uh, wrap up this discussion on the Holy Spirit. Until I see you next week, God bless you. Take care.